The second passage from the lectionary for this morning, the gospel reading is from John chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. We see a mention of a festival at the beginning. It's the uh, festival of Passover. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father, will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. And others said, no, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Like the Greeks in this text in the Gospel according to John, we're all kind of looking for God, aren't we? Looking every day. Reminds me of the story of the two little boys who were always in trouble, whether at school or at church, and they were brought into the preacher's office. And one stayed out in the administrative assistant's office, and the other little boy came in and sat in a chair so large his feet didn't even touch the floor, and the preacher leaned forward and in a stern voice said, Son, do you know where God is? And he bolted out of the room, charged past his friend, and said, we got to get out of here. They've lost God, and they're blaming it on us. <laughs> We've all kind of lost God somewhere along the way, haven't we? Where is God? when you're hurting, when you've lost a loved one or a pet that was like a member of your family or you're feeling some kind of pain, where is God now? That's the question the Greeks were asking, sir, we, we want to see Jesus. Or you can read the older translations, the King James, which is still one of the best translations ever. At this point says, sir, we would see Jesus. As I travel around the country or around the world, I notice as I stand in different pulpits, there are sometimes signs in the pulpits. I don't know if you all knew this. We don't have any signs up here. Maybe it's a good thing. I don't know. But you see all kinds of signs in these pulpits. They're messages to the pastor, whoever's preaching. I remember preaching in a retirement village once, and it was a huge sign in all caps with big exclamation points that said, speak up. And then another one under it's no louder than that. Uh, I remember seeing one in many places that said, thou shalt not sing, uh, because some pastors can't, and they should just get away from the microphone. Or maybe that's a message to pastors who try to sing in every sermon. I don't know, but there are all these signs all over the place in pulpits. But the one I've seen the most is the one I read in this text. Sir, we would see Jesus. Maybe that's a message to those of us who preach to remember 
that we're not really the point. The point is introducing people to the living Lord, to the Savior and the Lord, that people don't really come to church on Sunday morning to be entertained or hear the preacher's latest pet peeves or some kind of warmed over Unitarianism, but be to be reintroduced to the Savior and the Lord. That we are to be Christ bearers, that's the meaning behind the name Christopher, the one who bears Christ. We are all called to do that in some way or another. And that's what the Greeks were looking for. They wanted to meet Jesus. They wanted to see Jesus. They are gathered in the court of the Gentiles for the festival of Passover. Now, I've talked about how ICPC's sanctuary is very much like the temple. And the court of the Gentiles would be uh, where the narthex is. So you just gather, a, imagine a bunch of Greeks gathered back there wanting to see Jesus. Now, why does John even tell this story? Why does he tell it at all? He does it because his whole gospel is geared to sharing the good news with the Greeks, the Gentiles, and they want to know it. Why do they want to know it? Why is it so important to them? Well, there are several reasons. One is that they were inveterate travelers always wanting to learn new things. You've known people like this, people who like to travel the world. Some do it when they're retired and they have plenty of money and they just go lots of places because they want to learn new things. That's what the Greeks were like. Or you may know somebody who's a perpetual student. They just get, the person keeps getting more and more degrees uh, and they just can't stop studying. They love to study and that's a great thing. I remember when I was working on my PhD at the University of Pittsburgh, there was another PhD candidate who believed in reading only primary sources. He didn't like to read secondary sources. He was working on this world-class dissertation that was going to change the world. But the problem was the articles in uh, many of these uh, journals were in different languages. So every time he came across a new article that he wanted to read and it was in some different language, he would stop and learn that language. Uh, I said, what have you learned lately? Danish. Oh, really? For one article, yes, but I was able to understand the whole thing. He learned seven different languages working on this dissertation. The latest one, so what's the latest one? Swedish. I think this guy is still working on this PhD. I don't know if he's ever going to finish the thing. The Greeks were like that. They loved to study and learn. The Greek historian Herodotus, 500 years before Christ, had traveled the world, the ancient world especially, just to learn new things. And that's the way the Greeks were. They loved going here and there. I want you to, to picture them as a school of fish just appearing there in the court of the Gentiles like Japanese tourists taking pictures of the cherry blossoms blooming in Washington, D.C. They're just everywhere trying to learn new things. But there's something more going on here, isn't there? They were also seekers after truth. They loved reading philosophy, the latest philosophy, the latest religion. They wanted to learn everything they could. And they had heard about this Jesus, this street preacher, this Jesus, who had a new spin on philosophy and religion that they had never heard in the whole Hellenistic world. They, they wanted to hear about it. It was more than Socrates, more than Plato, more than Aristotle. And they had to hear what he said. They wanted to meet him. They watched him cleanse the temple. They watched him take on the Jewish authorities without fear. They could see that he was not afraid of the Roman authorities as well. They had to meet him to learn more about who he was. And so they came to Philip, whose name is a Greek name. By the way, it Philip. Philip means philos, and hippos, it literally means lover of horses, the one who loves horses. And Philip was clueless, like most of the disciples, so he went to Andrew, whose name was also Greek, and it means male or husband in Greek, and Andrew didn't know what to do either. So they said, let's just take him to the man. Let's just, let's go to Jesus. So they did. And Jesus launched into 
this sermon. He didn't speak to where they were. He didn't listen to what they wanted to know. He just launched into this thing about the hour is now coming when I'll be glorified and the grain of wheat will fall into the ground and if it dies it'll bear much fruit and, and my, my hour is coming and I don't know about you, but if I wanted to see Jesus and I went to him and he preached this really weird sermon, I wondered if I really wanted to meet him after all. I mean, what's going on here? Well, there's a lot more than you can see on the surface. What's really going on here is the Gospel of John is trying to help us understand that there's only one way you can really see and understand Jesus. Only one way at all. Don't look at the infancy narratives, says John. In fact, John doesn't think they're important at all. Don't, he doesn't care about the cute little baby in the manger. It's no big deal. He doesn't even have it in his gospel. And Mark doesn't either. Of course, Mark thinks the world's coming to an end, so he doesn't care. But Matthew and Luke, they throw in stories about Mary and Joseph and Bethlehem because they think, well, we need to find out where he came from. John doesn't care about that. He said, that's not important. His, his gospel begins, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. I don't care about where he came from. And don't look at his teachings. Oh, you'll get a glimpse of what he's about there. Don't even look at his healings. Even he said, when he healed somebody, don't tell anybody about this because this isn't the important thing. So what is it? You want to see Jesus? You want to know Jesus? You need to look on the cross to his atoning work and his suffering, his sacrifice for you and me. That, you really want to understand Jesus? That's what you have to look at to get a, even a glimpse of who he is. And in this one simple act of love, he says more and does more than all the philosophies the world has ever known. Oh, you can make Christianity more complicated than it needs to be and talk about Christology and all kinds of different ways of looking at Jesus and a lot of different sides of theology and the faith, but you don't have to. Some of you make it really complicated. You don't have to. You understand Jesus. You just need to look at the cross. I was talking to someone not long ago who said he was a lifelong Christian. He was very active in his church. And he's wondering about it all now. Not sure what he really believes anymore. Doubting, doubting a lot of it. Happens to all of us. Even happens to preachers. You know, wondering about it. I remember when I joined the church, it was a long time ago, as our young people are joining and being confirmed and recognized today. I, I remember I answered all these questions about Jesus and the faith. and I remember wondering, how much of this do I really believe? I'm saying the words. My parents seem to believe it. They act like they do sometimes. And I remember in college wondering if I believed any of it. And then I had a religious experience that just made the whole thing deeper. You're going to go through some times, some ups and downs in your life where you just wonder about it all, and then there are other times where you will believe it more than you could ever imagine, more than you ever thought you would, and that's what happened to me. The only way I could get there was to look at the cross, the simple act where Jesus did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped and held on to, but emptied himself in the great canonic motif, becoming a doulos, a servant, a slave, becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross, that you and I might have life. That's when you begin to get it. That's when you begin to understand who this Jesus really is. There's a place called Guguletu, which is a black township right outside of Cape Town, and I will never forget visiting there, leaving some of our students there to live for a while, preaching there, how poor the people were. The whole thing looked like a city dump. And then I remembered that Jesus was crucified on a city dump outside the city of Jerusalem. And that's why in Gugaletu, Good Friday is a bigger deal than Easter. It goes on for hours and hours because this suffering servant understands 
their pain. So, you want to see Jesus? Look at the cross. You know, I teach pastors and seminary students how to end sermons, and I talk to them about, oh, we may have to have a tearjerker story or some humor or something to just really inspire. I don't know how to end this sermon. I have no idea how to end this sermon today. So you're going to have to help me. You're going to have to end it yourselves by spending the rest of your life seeking Jesus. Look for him at the cross. But be careful. When you find him, it will change your life. To this one be all honor and blessing and glory and praise from this day forth and forevermore. God bless you all.